Because of the following special program, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. It's time to get all your Star Wars news in a single file. This is Making Tracks. Here are your hosts, Mark Nubo and Dave Tree. That's not true. You're listening to episode 10 of Making Tracks. I'm your co-host, Mark Newbold, and joining me, as always, on the show, Dave. Dave, the floor is yours. I mean, do your intro. Do a good intro this time. Big yourself up. This introduction is brought to you by Nestle Pure Life Water. Still spring water for all ages. All ages, really? There might be baby water. or I, oh, I've, I've fluffed this up already. You said to do the biggest intro ever. And I can't even do that. I don't know. I think this is pretty big as, as uh, adverts, <laughs> adverts for water. It's goes. pretty low. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Uh, I'm very good. How are you doing, Mark? Come on, come, what, what, what's been going on in the in the life of Newbold in the last couple of weeks? Uh, you know, the normal sort of nonsense. Uh, lots of writing and lots of work. Lots of other random bits of tap that don't really matter. Uh, it's been good. It's been busy. And uh, I, I've not had as much weather to talk about, even though apparently, <laughs> no matter whether it's hot or cold, there is always the same amount of weather apparently it's like a constant no matter what the weather is it's always there so but we just don't talk about it so how about you dave uh much much the same sort side of things really school kids are back uh-huh. so it's a, like a period of transition hunkering down and building up more towards like sort of like the christmas trade side of things yeah i, I don't really have anything i can really report it's gone real quick it's all a bit of a blur and i can't really even think about what's been going on to say hey yeah this has been what's been happening i, I really can't it's all, all all just passed me by maybe maybe <laughs> i've been in hibernation <laughs> like, no, it's, it's all that hunkering down you've been doing day that's what it is hunkering in in the dungeon that i've got here and stuff like that there is that there is that we've got loads going on on this episode lots of random talk from you and me obviously but we've also got the second part of our interview with bill kimberlin return of the jedi visual effects editor bill kimberlin and also the second part of uh, my interview from way back with dennis murin which was rather cool so let's let's dive into one of those interviews first before we go off on one of our tangential talks of absolute nonsense let's catch up with bill kimberlin bill has got a book out called inside the star wars empire it's just come out it's an absolutely fascinating and read get it on amazon get it as soon as you can loads of anecdotes really really interesting for now part two of me and bill having a chat so do you think george is underappreciated we we get the sense now certainly slightly older fans like myself have been fans since we were kids and late 40s sometimes wonder now that george has sold and moved on and, and enjoying his retirement that that maybe he he is underappreciated given all the things you've just listed do you feel that sometimes like you say his true worth will come out over not just in in filmic sense but in terms of the the progression that he made with digital and all the other things do you think his worth will come is still coming he'll be more appreciated as the years go on i i think definitely uh, uh, i live in the san francisco bay area and it is the most dynamic san francisco and silicon valley is the most dynamic place in the world right now yeah and one of the things george wanted to do was to bring his uh, film company to San Francisco and located it in the Presidio because all the young, talented people, they don't want to live anywhere else. They don't want to live in a suburb. They want to live in San Francisco. That's why we have all these buses, these Google buses that sometimes people in San Francisco complain about because – if you didn't have the buses, you couldn't get any employees. They don't want to live in Silicon Valley. They don't want to live in the suburbs. They want to live in San Francisco. And I think George saw that coming. I helped him do a little documentary to sort of sell the city on the idea of putting a digital center there. And now that digital center is just part of a massive um, complex of uh, digital companies of every stripe. Now, your your specific job that you had, the the editing job that you had, what did that entail, and how closely would that bring you to be working with, for example, George and Richard Marquand, obviously director of Jedi. 
Right. So I was a visual effects editor. And so uh, when I started the first week, we went over to George's cutting room where he had his chem editing machine and he sat a small group down to go over what he wanted to do in the space battle, which is what I was the visual effects editor for. So there was my supervisor, Ken Ralston. There was myself. There was uh, Joe Johnston, the art director. There were some production people. And he simply outlined what he wanted uh, to see happen here, just so we all sort of got on the same page. So all the camera crews worked in the D building in an area that was curtained off with uh, black curtains. So each crew could be working on a different uh, set of uh, ships that they were photographing using these computer controlled uh, systems where the camera would move, the model would never move. And they would do a bunch of different passes, one pass for the what we called the, the, the beauty pass, which would be the model, another pass for the engines, another pass for any running lights, uh, etc. So they would make a black and white test of that. And when they looked at it and thought that it was uh, good, then they would load in color film and all of this would wind up in editorial and these pieces of a shot in the one case, a shot that I worked on SB 19, which is on the front of my book inside the star Wars empire, a memoir, uh, that shot SB 19 took, I forget whether it was three or four camera crews working for a couple of months to get all the pieces to the shot. And it was my job to then assemble all those pieces, put them together and see how they actually ran when all of the ships were against the star field and a planet and the Death Star and then figure out where the laser fire might go um, and put it together in such a way that I could call through the production people. I could call George over and ask him uh, to take a look at it with my supervisor and uh, see if he approved it. And And the greatest approval you ever got out of George was great. If he said, <laughs> Great. Then uh, you were done. OK, move on. And so uh, I did work with him. I remember I was sitting in uh, in editorial one day and George had supposed to have come, been going to come over and talk to my supervisor. And everybody left for lunch and I happened to be sitting there and George showed up and he said, where is Ken, my boss? And I said, they've all gone to lunch. And he said, well, can you show me the shot? And I said, sure. So I walked into this room where we had these giant Vista Vision movieolas. And I had the shot all uh, threaded up because we were expecting him earlier. And uh, I ran it for him. And he looked at the shot and he said, uh, uh, take this X-Wing and blow him up right at this frame and he put his finger on the X-Wing and uh, for some stupid reason I turned around to him and I said I don't think we can do that now I don't know what I was thinking <laughs> I was green I was new I was probably a little nervous and he turned to me and he said of course we can with such authority that I, I immediately realized uh I needed to uh, study this a little more before I start telling George Lucas something he can't do. And, uh, you know, that's this is the story of George's life. He people have been telling him since he was in college stuff that he couldn't do. You, you know, you can't make a space movie and you and you they don't make money. And uh, 
when he went over budget on Empire, the bank wouldn't lend him any more money, and people were telling him sequels don't make money, et cetera, et cetera. So when you get a, a life history of that, and um, they were all wrong and you were right, you don't uh, accept no's uh, graciously. But he didn't yell. He wasn't angry. He just said in a very positive way, yes, we can do this. And uh, of course we could. I was going to say, did George have a, a clear vision of what he wanted? When you, when you sat down with George, like that moment, he, he saw that bang, I want that X-Wing gone in that moment. Did he always have a clear vision of what he wanted? He always came across, oh, nice red cup, by the way. He always came across as very collaborative uh, in, in that he was happy to, to take ideas and such. But did, did he have a clear idea in his head of what he wanted to see on that screen? Yes, he one of the pleasures of working for someone is when you work for someone that actually knows uh, what he wants. And I remember uh, whenever George was gone and we were working on Jedi, he would have to go you know, over to England and visit the sets or whatever. And uh, so decisions would kind of pile up. Uh, you know, can we... Can we tear that set down? Are we done? Does the cutting room have enough to work on this, that, or the other thing? And people started to get a little nervous. And then I remember him coming in one morning, and uh, we had collected a bunch of stuff that we were going to run for him uh, to get his approval. And uh, the producers were wringing their hands and telling him they needed this. And he said, "Bring the you want decisions? Bring the lights down. Lights went down. Yes, no, redo. That's fine. Move on. Bang, 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 bang. I mean, million dollar decisions were flying around that room because tearing a set down and making a mistake and having to put it back together again is not a good idea. Yeah. So unlike a lot of directors that I have worked with, this guy really uh, it's it's like he. Uh, knew exactly how he wanted to be. And as far as being a collaborating uh, person, I think he was open to that. Uh, I remember looking at some map paintings and uh, people were sort of kicking around the idea that it needed a little bit more uh, liveliness to it. And uh, so he, on the spot, came up with this little creature that was going to be over in the side corner there were just there were times when we threw in things that no one would ever notice unless of course you watch the film multiple times so uh, maybe that's why people were able to watch it multiple times there were so many little things added and and another thing about george he he always i'm i was looking at a woody allen film the other day and it's shot in italy it's a period piece. They're on dirt roads. They have classic cars, but all the cars are absolutely pristine. There's not a speck of dust on them. Well, when George did a spaceship, it looked like it had been beaten around the universe for a, a hundred years or so, you know, and he was sort of the first person to do that. You didn't see that in 2001. It, the the sci-fi was sort of, if it wasn't brand new and shiny and modern and futuristic, it wasn't any good. And George comes along and says, no, this stuff should all be, you know, like a battleship that's been through World War II. And that adds so much credibility. One of the things you mentioned in the book, which is a fantastic read, by the way, it really is. The, and it really struck me as quite hilarious. You mentioned that at one point George had said, um, yes, uh, George had said, about doing a, com a comedy Star Wars film. How relaxed yeah. was he with with enjoying Star Wars? Because some people take it so seriously. Other people like to have fun with it. I think people should have fun with it. It's, it's, a, it's supposed to be fun. But how loose and, and, and easy was he with, with doing that? Do you think it was something he meant, or was it something he just said in the spur of the moment? You know, uh, you, you remember there was this uh, film called Hardware Wars? Oh, yeah. That was a spoof on Star Wars. And it was got a lot of play, got a lot of attention. I, I think I can't remember. We might have run that there. And uh, I think he had a sense of humor 
about it. And he, he did mention in that screening how he wanted to do this uh, comedy version, uh, uh, something like that. There, there's a lot of humor in his Star Wars movies that I find missing from some of the newer ones. I mean, there's a, there's a level of, uh, sort of hints of contemporary politics sometimes in the, in the evil characters. And there's definitely a, some, uh, a sense of humor. And I think, you know, these are things that come out of his personality. In other words, when that famous line of Yoda's, uh, you know, you do or not do, there is no try. That's, you know, that comes out of George's personality. Yeah. You, you decide on that you're going to get something done and you do it and you don't listen to naysayers. You move ahead. So I, I think he, he takes his characters very seriously. You know, he's mentioned like a lot of authors that they're like his children. And, uh, he has made some negative comments about the whole Star Wars thing kind of being taken away from him, yeah. even though he, you know, he, he's sold it with the full knowledge. Uh, but I think, uh, yeah, he's, he's very close to them, but at the same time is not didactic. He's, he's got a sense of humor. Time to get all your Star Wars news in a single file. Welcome to Making Tracks. Solo has come out on Blu-ray. It's out on digital download. It's out next week on Blu-ray, 4K, DVD, 8-track, Smoke Signal. I mean, whatever, whatever <laughs> you can get. Max. Beta Max. Beta oh, Max. I wish, can't you imagine? I wish they'd bring Beta Max. I mean, we've talked about Solo before. We both very much enjoyed the film. We had a great time at the press screening and all the yeah. stuff that we did. We were going to Pinewood and all that malarkey. Great fun. Now, sort of, where are we now? Five months since it came out. Is it that long? It might not even be that long. What are your thoughts on Solo? Now you've lived with it for a little bit and it's about to come into your home, so to speak. How do you feel about Solo as a film? I would still absolutely love it. Buzzing about it with every home release, the extras is more the bigger thing for me than the film itself because inevitably you kind of go off and see it several times. It's not so much, oh, I'm dying to see this. It's kind of like all the supplemental material, which is quite nice the way that this is done now because it is the boost behind a lot of these things. Now, I'm hoping there's, well, with things like Rogue One and with Solo, where they've had stormy production in terms of making of the films and stuff like that, you're not necessarily going to get the warts and all as such. Or even if you look back at Rogue One, the amount of content that's missing from that in terms of scenes and stuff like that, you know We'll never see the light of day. It's arguably a similar sort of scenario with Solo, but it still doesn't mean that you don't get some cool things and, and like reasonings behind it, which I felt was kind of lacking really at the release of the film itself compared to other Disney releases that have gone before with all of the, the visual dictionaries and stuff like that. Although that was there, you get loads of all these other things that like feed into it. It, it really wasn't quite there for Solo because it was yeah. following hot on the heels of the home release of Last Jedi and, you know, only a few months before the, the theatrical release. There's a lot of gaps of knowledge and, and information there. So I'm, I'm really quite looking forward to it. And I hope it will be a, a second spur of interest for it. It's quite interesting now that I'm seeing a lot of my wider friends that seem to be acknowledging the home release of this more than the film itself. These are not so much casual Star Wars fans, because any Star Wars fan should have gone out and seen it. But what I mean is that people are kind of like are more aware of that coming out at a home release, that on my sort of like um, social circles, than when it was out for the theatrical release. Don't you think that's a shame that, that they dropped the ball so badly that people are more aware of it on DVD and video than they yeah, were? Yeah, well, I think that's the price you pay when you're trying to like going up in the same sort of few weeks as infinity war and deadpool and there was a whole heap of film. yeah there was a whole heap of films that was like literally running during that period of time that it's just like there's only so much money that people can do and, and i think that's kind of the trouble there as to whether or not if that was the right move to take from previous reasonings of like moving it because of mary poppins and don't. any sort of confusion that it might oh, have created man. what are your thoughts on that one mark funny enough i've got thoughts on that one i saw the trailer <laughs> don't laugh i saw the trailer today for mary poppins returns which to me ranks right up there with like batman returns and superman 4 and 
and the trailer looks great and and she's awesome and it's got half the cast of Mamma Mia in it and la 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 talking penguins and my first thought was well thank goodness they didn't hold Solo back to December because I mean like you know why would you release a Star Wars film in December and I'm glad they didn't release it at the same time as Mary Poppins because I don't think I would have gone to see Solo I think I would have just kept going back to the cinema to see Mary Poppins again and again oh I mean what were they thinking Dave what were they thinking tell me before I flip a views what were they thinking why would they not put a Star Wars film out in December and why would they not put it out against Mary Poppins when you've got Aquaman coming out in December and you've got all these other sci-fi superhero films it's a busy time of the year now it's almost as busy as the summer or you know the old May slot which now everybody sees clear for Marvel if you're smart which is what Solo should have done I don't know I just I just don't quite get the logic of that one well it's because it's their own studios I guess internally when you think of outside of the cinema side of things itself at a, at a retail level in Disney stores they want to be doing promotional periods for every single release. They don't necessarily want to be doing two at the same time because mm. if you think of the window displays and stuff like that, it's competing with one another. The reality is they don't climb a clash, and you, this isn't the first time that that's happened with a... I was going to say, like, toy-based because the other one is toy-based, but you've had this in the circles before, G.I. Joe Retaliation. That got postponed and pushed back because... It was coming out where well, they said they wanted to upgrade it to 3D. That was the official reason. And they felt that it had a better uh, chance at, at the box office. But it was also kind of going up head to head with the new Spider-Man film. And I think it might have been Iron Man 3 as well or, or, or something. When you, when you look at what it was doing, it was actually kind of almost being lost between all these other big releases. So they said they're converting it for 3D. It was almost the opposite of what happened with Solo. It had a massive negative effect on the toys because the toys were released with no film to support it I remember that, so yeah. for a good sort of and we're, we're not talking like a short postponement it was like nearly 12 months that they had it going off because I, I think it was due to come out i think it was like september october and it didn't come out until like the following may it had questionable results but who, who knows what the real thinking is here you never know you're never going to get the full actual picture until way way down the line when someone who's got no vested interest in these things anymore either because they were part of that production and they've retired you never really fully get the, the full picture until way after the fact the reality is for the average cinema goer i don't think it makes a blind bit of difference arguably at the holiday times you, you've got the opportunity to go more than once and maybe they're thinking that again you've only got so much money to go around but then they yeah. put it up against within spitting distance of of infinity war <laughs> which is their own thing i suppose the problem disney's got is that they've got so many branches they've got lucasfilm pixar disney live action animation yeah. all the other things there's going to be these little collisions but i still get the sense i mean one i just don't see why you wouldn't release star wars in december i just don't see what the clash is with mary poppins at all there's no clash at all one's disney live action one's lucasfilm they're separate things and they're completely different genres and i think it would have been counter programming so if you don't want to, you know i'm not that fussed about seeing mary poppins i'll probably see it once you know because i'm curious but i'm not going to go and see it multiple times but you can certainly see some couples going well the missus goes to see star wars and the husband goes to see poppins or whatever it may be you know maybe it was a plan by rian johnson with the last jedi for the for the layer scene um, maybe this was like part of the pre-marketing thing, you know, to like kind of like bed people down and then like that's the real reason behind it. There probably will be someone out there on YouTube that will make that the reason why, you know, you like some complete nut job and you'd be like, all oh, right. This, this is freaky you say that because I, I always think, you know, when the Internet first started, there was all these sort of like UFO conspiracy things were on the internet like project blue book and stuff and i used to read them and it used to freak me out because there's creepy stuff on there but there was a little part of me used to think like watching the video from the ring yeah. that somebody knows i'm looking at this stuff and something's going to happen <laughs> i think you just saying space mary poppins was a bit of free advertisement yeah. for the new mary poppins film there's actually something in that no this is all about almost kind of conditioning the population <laughs> ahead of the arrival of it that's yeah. what it is. Because if you think about it, there was the other reference in like Guardians of the Galaxy 2. My my word. And again, that's right, a Disney yeah. film. We yeah. are through the looking glass here, Mark. They know where you live, you know. Making know tracks, making conspiracy tracks. <laughs> I love it. I'm worried. I'm worried. I'm on that note of being worried. <laughs> When I sat down 10 years ago with Dennis Muren, I wasn't worried. I was excited. I was very excited. And I had a chat with him. It was for my old site, Lightsaber. Now, 
for your oral pleasure. That's A U R A L. Listen to the second part, just in case you're confused. Uh, listen to the second part. I, of, I know you are of my interview or my chat from ten years ago. So I was much younger and a lot slimmer with Dennis Muir. Do you do a lot of research and development? I mean, obviously, I know ILM are problem solvers going right back to the 70s, but is, is that another large part of your job? You know, I, I do it, but I don't do it with the ILM group. I bring I, ideas to ILM, but, they, uh, you know, some of the ILM guys, they are doing a lot of stuff for a lot of different departments. And and what I do is I just approach it differently from a, I do, completely from a show standpoint. You know, I can sit there and be totally frustrated and feel very sorry for the optical guys who are trying to get rid of these map lines of doing take after take and... Or the CG guys, and you know, they have a partially badly rendered frame, and they have to re-render the entire shot again because of that. And I just feel so sorry for them. I know there's got to be a different way. You know, it's, it's hard. It was just hard to convince the the ILM R and D folks about some of those problems because they're so busy just trying to put the fires out. You know what I mean? So I'm coming to it from a, the daily fires that are going on. Yeah. I come through. I just always come into this from a, a different point of view, more of a filmmaker point of view. And that's where I think, okay, it's worth the effort to try to get rid of the map lines. It's worth the effort. To try to fix these few frames in a render, not to have to re-render the whole shot. And one way to do that is to paint it. So if we can get a paint program and paint onto a digital image, you know, then we can fix that and not re-render the whole shot. Well, those are like revolutionary ideas back then, because nobody kind of thought that you could do that. Or, or, or also another thing was going on. It wasn't pure, and a lot of computer folks want people want things pure, and they felt that it was sort of you know very crude to paint out artifacts. They should be able to re-render it and have it be perfect. But I didn't care about that because I have to you know I've got a deadline I'm working on. You're just after the end result. Yeah, yeah, just the end results, all that matters. And that and that thinking actually is still going on to this day. The idea of things being pure, and it's yeah. very very costly. It doesn't really fit into the industry. There's usually a lot of more efficient ways to do things, and the result will be just as good, and it'll be less expensive. And you know, I really encourage people to do that. Not make things that are too precious. Yeah. Anything you work on, I think you should be able to destroy it before it's done and have to do it again. It be so lucky or, or perfect or, or even repeatable. I don't think you should necessarily even be, have to repeat it or be able to repeat it like a lot of computer stuff. You know, you can repeat it over and over and over again, but that's not necessarily a good thing if you're just doing a one-off for a movie. I was lucky enough, actually, last week to interview uh, Irving Kirshner. He mentioned Spielberg in that Spielberg prefers using film to digital as, as opposed to George forging ahead with the digital revolution, obviously. How do you stand on that? Obviously, you would be a proponent of digital. When you're making a movie these days with somebody who wants to stay with film, how do the two mesh together? You mean in my mind? In general. How do I compare them, or do I prefer working in digital, or what? Yeah, well, do, I mean, I'm assuming you prefer digital nowadays, because you've, you've used it for so long, but, but Spielberg appears to want to stick with the, uh, the old film, film stock. He likes to feel the film in his hands. Does that present a problem these days, effects-wise, or is it, is it no real difference? It doesn't. I've, I, you know, I've, the only films that I've done that have actually been digital movies, you know, if you're talking about acquiring the data on the set, you know, was Phantom Menace and, uh, you know, the first or the second or whatever it is, first and second Star Wars, uh, one and two. Yeah. Those were the, and I didn't even work on three. Those are the only shows I've worked on with digital acquisition. And that's all that, that Steven and those guys are talking about. After after you shoot your dailies, they don't care how, you know, what you do with it. So I don't really have a problem with you shooting the film or digital. I think there's there's big wins in shooting a digital that have not, that have not even been discovered yet. And I have been encouraging Steven's cameraman, Janusz, Janusz Kaminski, yeah. other cameramen to shoot in digital is for no other reason to force the engineers to make the equipment do what they, what those guys want to do. Or else the engineers are just going to make cameras that they think are going to be what people want, which isn't necessary at all what people want. So that's all I've been doing. And I, mean, I don't know if they're, they're doing another indie. I don't know if they're going to do that digital or not. And Janusz yeah. is going to shoot that. But, you know, I have no idea which way they're going to go with it. No involvement as yet on the new indie film? No, uh, no involvement. But speaking of Indiana Jones, of course, you made an appearance in Raiders of the Lost Ark. What are your memories of that little scene? It was a lot of fun, and it was very, very strange uh, being on the other side of the camera and just looking up and seeing, you know, Spielberg there and Richard Edlund was the cameraman on it and all, yeah. you know, and all the light guys and everything looking right at me and lighting me. <laughs> and, of course, being with Harrison and all was really fun. I think it was very strange. It was, it was very neat. We just did it in about half a day, but it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. I remember reading a piece about that scene, actually, the, 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 the establishing shot of the, the Sunderland on the, on the water. There was a lot of effects work into that, into that shot, wasn't there? There was a practical model and a, and a map painting. It was quite involved, as I remember. Yeah, it was just, it was just a painting. 
meaning the, for some crazy reason, the airplane was right over here by ILM, yeah. the other side of the bay, but it couldn't fly. And it was just in storage sitting on the water there. I yeah. got my memory right. And I don't think it's there anymore. And, and that's why they, you know, we just shot it here locally. I, the whole bottom of the plane was still there. And I maybe, I can't remember if the wings were even still, I think they were still on it. But the background was all wrong. It's probably what it was. So everything from a certain point on up was a painting. And then from down below was, was the actual airplane that used to fly, but uh, didn't fly anymore. And we shot on that plane and everything. All the interiors were done. All right. You must have been so pleased with Raiders, though, that the way that the film came out, ultimately. I was, I was doing Dragon Slayer at the time, so I didn't have that much tender, uh, inter- or I wasn't watching what was going on in Raiders. But to see the final film together and have it be, have so much energy was pretty neat. Although no, Dragon Slayer was quite a, a progressive film at the time, wasn't it? Because it was, that was around the era that you'd got Go Motion going, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So we established Go Motion sort of for that film, which was, which we had sort of experimented on with the Tauntaun and uh, Empire Strikes Back. But we got a lot more, a lot more to dance with it in the, in the Dragon Slayer. We shot that over at Pinewood, also on the live action work and everything. Well, I was lucky enough to meet you, actually, believe it or not, about three years ago at um, the Hulk premiere at uh, the Empire Leicester Square. Oh, really? Yeah, you, well, I saw you walking towards me and I went over to shake your hand and so, somebody sort of led you away and I managed to say, hello, Mr. Murin, and that was about it. But, but uh, you must have very good memories of that film because effects-wise, that was absolutely stunning. Yeah, that, you know, that was a real mixed bag, and I, some of it I really, I think it came out real well, and we had so much trouble with that green color, and I think it just, it was just almost insurmountable. I thought it was going to help us with, a, with green being so radically different than anything in the real world, you know, the color they picked, the shade of green they yeah. wanted and everything, uh, was so sort of vivid that it could always just look like it was, I don't know, like, like, it just looked wonderful, it didn't really have to ever match anything, but in fact, it meant that you you always just looked at the Hulk, and uh, they just that's something we don't want to really <laughs> too much because there's too too many shots to do. You know, they're not all perfect, and uh, that and that was a tough show. There's another question then: if you could be brutal with yourself and look back over your career and pick one special effect that you'd like to redo again, which one would it be? I probably w- I probably wouldn't tell you. <laughs> I thought not. Somebody would feel very bad if I said it. No, that's fair enough. So that's fair enough. On that, so I, I can't say that. There, but, there's a lot of them. <laughs> a lot. And being a perfectionist, it, it must, it must, well, I guess it rankles everybody, doesn't it, sir? So. Yeah, you know, I'm not so much a perfectionist as some people are, I, but I just want to get through the shot, you know, and, and some people really are perfectionists, and, you know, you, and nobody can see the difference between, you know, what you're working on now, what, and the same thing two weeks ago, and I don't like that at all. I think you reach a point where you say, yes, that will work. And there's many, many times when we run out of time or, you know, we just didn't have the magic wasn't together correctly to make this, to make a shot work. You know, it's too late to start over again or whatever. I suppose it's like catching lightning in a bottle a hundred thousand times on, a, on each each movie you do, isn't it? Trying to get that right element. That's right. It always seems like that, especially when you're trying to do something that hasn't been done. First thing I do when I finish a film is I just, in my mind, consider it obsolete and try to figure, okay, if I was doing that same movie again, what would I do differently? I just don't want to do the same thing again. And that's hard to figure out because there's nowhere to look for something new. I spent a lot of time looking at you know, at artwork and, and the real world for inspiration and stuff. You know, there's some great stuff on that Planet Earth series. You know, we we're, we're just got that over here finally. Yes, it's amazing, yeah. Just phenomenal yeah. stuff. You know? And there's great inspiration and things like that, as opposed to copying movies you've already seen, because that's very limited. You know, it's a, that's a copy of reality. And if you're copying movies, then you're a double copy. Are there any big movies of the last 20, 25 years that you didn't work on that you wish you had? There's probably been quite a few, you know. I mean, but I'm not sure what. I mean, I didn't, there wasn't anything that came out that I wish, I did want to work on Pearl Harbor, but I wanted to do AI instead because I'd worked with Spielberg on that. But I really like those big, uh, you know, spectacle movies. And I never actually done a war film of that scale. And I was really tempted to do that, but I, you know, I wanted to do the Steven thing and the Kubrick thing and everything. I thought that was wonderful. You know, I wasn't so excited about the Lord of the Rings films. Because until I saw them, and I thought, boy, they came up with some great ideas. But I, I kind of didn't think they were ever going to do all that really interesting force perspective stuff, which I love. Because I just never thought that a first unit crew would take the time to do it. Because they certainly don't like to do that in, in L.A. But I guess being in New Zealand with uh, Jackson being the director and producer, he could say, nope, this is the best way to do it. We're going to do it like this. And that was great. You know, I thought that stuff was wonderful. 
given that you like to finish a project, move on, finish a project, move on, and, and consider it obsolete, has the lure of doing a TV series ever appealed to you? Because obviously you're doing that on a weekly basis. No, it, it really hasn't, probably because quality, the movie doesn't have the impact in my mind on that small screen. You know, my memories are just, you know, and everybody's from my generation is, you know, you go into this, you know, first you get in the car and you go somewhere, it's a special event. And you get out and you go into this big giant room with a huge screen, the lights go down, and there's this massive, you know, 30 foot tall or wide image that you're looking at for the next two hours. And that does not happen at home in your living room, even for the big screen. You can turn it off. Right away, the fact you can walk over and turn off a DVD means you yeah. lost. You know, you, 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 you were in control of it, and you're not in control of it when you're in a movie theater. Yeah. I love that feeling when something's just sort of taking over. TV just doesn't have it. It's the same as hearing your favorite song on the radio and, and listening to it on the disc, isn't it? You can, you can stop it on the disc and carry on playing, but when it's on the radio, it, it's grabbed you and it's got you where it wants you, really. Yeah, and, and you have to force yourself, you know, if you have to do something else, you know, you have to run off and use the restroom or something, you can't. So, so that just sort of gets you more excited about staying and hearing it, and you know, and you're in your you're suffering to hear it, <laughs> so it gets more of your attention. That's right. You were honoured about seven or eight years ago with a, a star on the Walk of Fame. How amazing was that? Because you were the first effects guy to get it, weren't you? Yeah, that was just that was pretty amazing. I had I just never thought it was going to happen. You know, my cousin had been trying for ten years to get me a star on the Walk of Fame. And I just kept saying, don't even bother. You know, I'm not interested. No one else is interested. Don't bother. And she said, no, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. And, you know, so just on her own, she gathered these letters from people, you know, Spielberg and Lucas, Cameron and lots of other folks, and kept sending them in every single year, the same package. And she kind of got to know the, you know, the secretary of the committee group. And every year they voted and every year it was rejected. And I just kept saying, don't do it. It's a waste of time. I don't care about it. And then suddenly, I guess it was when Phantom Menace came out and the BES was involved and they knew, already knew who I was from my cousin. They said, yes. I just kept thinking they made a mistake. They're going <laughs> to, you know, they're going to say, oh, I'm sorry. It's the Ryan. It's Dennis Miller, not Dennis Mira. Yeah. Right? They stay home. But, you know, it was really great. And then a lot of guys showed up. Ray, Harry Essen showed up, and Cameron, and George, and R2, and C3PO, and my family, and it was great. I just walked on that street for, for years, you know, growing up in L.A., and when they first put them in. And the crazy thing is, the location that was available, there were three locations, and I picked one right underneath the old Hollywood Theater that's now the Guinness Book of Records Theater. But it's just the old Hollywood movie theater where we had a sneak preview of Equinox. And that's why I picked it. I just, this is amazing. This place is available. Well, that's where I want to be. One final question. When you had the chance back in 96, 97 to revisit the special editions, the, the Star Wars special editions, how special was it for you coming back to those films after an extended period of time away from those movies? I was fine with doing it. I didn't at all feel that, you know, we're hurting anything. My feeling always was that the original version was always going to be there. And, and I don't know if that's necessarily happened. You know, George hasn't put the effort into doing an HD a super good quality HD of the original version. Hopefully yeah. that'll happen. Yeah. But at, and at the time, my feeling was we can finally make these shots better, you know? And he went through and picked a bunch of shots and I picked a bunch of shots and, and we redid them so they just looked a lot better. And I was I was fine with it. And I think I think it's gone overboard. I think there's been done, you know, in a few cases too many times and too many shots. I just feel as long as the original version is always there, that it's fine to be able to work on it later on. And, and sort of like, so what, you know? I'm, I'm not saying don't look at the original, but it makes me feel better if I can if I can finally get rid of some of those crummy motion control <laughs> that were done, you know, at, at uh, 3 a.m. in the morning that just weren't quite right or something of a spaceship. But you'll always have those great memories of being there at 3 a.m. doing it, though. Oh, God, yes. Well, thank you so much, Dennis. Well, sure. Really appreciate your time, and it's a pleasure to speak to you. Okay, uh, great, bye. Take care, bye. Hello, I'm Warwick Davis, and you're listening to Fanther Tracks. New York Comic Con, my God, that is amazing that you're doing that. <laughs> You've got to stop baiting people. They won't let you into the country for a reason, that's why. It's not so much <laughs> that they won't let you into America, it's that they won't let you back into the UK, you see, that's the real problem. There is very much oh, a, a truth to that. No, really? I'm not kidding. I'm, yeah, no, it's, it's very, st- I mean, that's a story for another time, you know, but... um I am allowed into America, but okay. when I go in with Chloe, we're both flagged for different reasons. Yeah, my, mine is down to the, the Anti-Terrorism Act oh, well, for being, being in the wrong place at the wrong time, and that is the genuine truth. And Chloe's <laughs> is on immigration, where she went in with her sister. The passport control officer put her sister's 
this photograph on Chloe's record and vice versa. So when they go through and you do the, the, the fingerprints and things like that, a different picture pops up. Um, so there's like notes on there to say, no, this is a mistake because you can't change them. But where, where we've been through first time we were detained <laughs> which was quite scary <laughs> and then the, following that we've been kind of like held up momentarily but as they read the case notes they then realize that oh no that's fine if you and me ever go to the states can we just meet there can we, can we, <laughs> yeah can we just meet there i think it's probably safer for me i actually haven't had any trouble because i used to head to the states to present at JoeCon all about uh, the british gi joe toys uh, as they were known over at action force and i've done fortune of doing that for about four years uh, and i haven't had any trouble where i've been across for that and i i asked someone who does work in national security state side and i just said oh you know just telling him the, the, the story behind it and i said you know is is there any chance that that's kind of now been lapsed then and he goes oh no 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 your, your record is permanent <laughs> so Wow. <laughs> but but it makes it sound like I'd done something. I really haven't. I was just literally, it was, I was a victim of circumstance and I was in the wrong area at the wrong time, but they have to record these things. And so that if for whatever reason you blip again, it's then a bit more suspect, but, um, there's always time. There's always time, Dave. But, but it involved stripping down to my uh, undercrackers and being held at gunpoint and all sorts. And it was pretty damn scary at the time. It's but, international uh, incident. Yeah, it was. It was. I was. I was like being held at gunpoint. There was like lots of dogs. I had to strip down and like bag search and all of that. But it was for a good reason. You know, the guys were doing their jobs and they had to record the the circumstances for anybody who was detained at that point i just hope you got your 250 pounds when jeremy beadle just appeared out of nowhere i tell you what i mean looking back i'm laughing but at the time it was scary to say the least you know there was like no room for a, a joke or, or anything like that i mean you, you honestly thought oh good grief where's this heading you know i'm going to be shipped off to guantanamo bay or something like that because it, 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 it was all like that you know it was all like chain link fences and barbed wire and you were like right we've cross reference questions and stuff like this and it was all very scary for, for something that had absolutely zero <laughs> to do with me on a Sunday morning down in Bournemouth. <laughs> Hi, this is Gareth Edwards, director of the best standalone Star Wars film since Caravan of Courage called Rogue One. You're listening to Panther Tracks. Enjoy. So, Dave, we've reached the end of episode 10 of Maker Tracks. It's been another epic. We're going to have a thousand downloads and a million likes, which is wonderful. <laughs> uh, double figures as well, you know. Who, If I was a betting man, I would have bet we've hit double figures. That's amazing. So, if people want to find you, Dave, in, in the real world, you know, with the internet, where can people find you? Well, you can find me in a little shop called All the Cool Stuff, which is a toy shop on the edge of the New Forest in Fordingbridge. You can find us on Facebook. There is All the Cool Stuff. Or Farthest From, as well, is a, a dedicated Star Wars toy show that we do. And that is Farthest From on Facebook as well. Still not sorted out the Twitter. And I think, you know, just, just as we talk about the weather and I do my introduction, I think I'll always say still not sorted out the Twitter. But like, Mark, where in the world outside of the amazing making tracks can people find you? People can find me, usually in front of the keyboard, but <laughs> often you can find me uh, as the loony behind the <laughs> Twitter account for <laughs> Panther Tracks. So if you haven't seen me monster set, generally me. Or you can find me on my own Twitter account, Prefect underscore timing. But generally anywhere that's got the word Panther Tracks in it is where you'll find me. Things are busy at the moment. We're working our way up towards New York Comic Con. So there's stuff coming up from there and uh, things happening. Obviously, we've got another Panther Day this year, which we're all looking forward to. Destination Star Trek. I know I shouldn't mention the ST word, but there it is. I don't mean sexually transmitted. I mean Star Trek. So, so <laughs> looking forward to that. So, Same yeah. thing. Oh, it's pretty, it's just some people. It is. So, <laughs> so looking forward to all of that. It's, it's very busy. Lots of fun. And let's wrap this one up. We will be back for episode 11 of Making Tracks. I'm going to say goodbye, Dave. Say goodbye to the adoring audience. Goodbye, everyone. I just wanted to make a special announcement to acknowledge with a heavy heart a Star Wars fan that lost his fight on Friday. A good friend of, of mine and of Farthest From, Ellie Ashton, passed away, unfortunately, at uh, an early age.
Elliot was very linked in with Star Wars collecting, particularly on the vintage side of things, but has helped me out personally with uh, some of the pro- Star Wars projects that I've done in the past, including the Palatoy archive that was for celebration. Also, the uh, 30th anniversary Empire Strikes Back toy exhibition that I did in the store. Elliot himself done plenty of his own Star Wars projects, most notably Star Wars, which was a Star Wars fan art exhibition uh, held in Leightonstone, uh, which is where Elliot lived. And through that number of exhibitions that he'd done for Star Wars, he managed to get the acknowledgement of a plaque unveiled for Stuart Freeborn who was the uh, a creature effects artist and makeup artist along with his wife, um, where Stuart was actually from Leighton Stone. And through the various exhibitions that Elliot done, um, he managed to get a plaque installed in Leighton Stone. So I just wanted to say it's very sad, and our thoughts are, are with his uh, friends and family. If you haven't checked out Star Wars, so that's not as in Wars, W-A-L-L, so Star Wars, you'll be able to see a lot of the contributing artists and the work that Elliot did. Uh, It was a fantastic exhibition that um, uh, had several outings in and around the area. But uh, our thoughts are with you and uh, you'll be sorely missed.